age appropriate ministry. We are wanderers, explorers, travelers, roaming the earth field by field, moment by moment, seeking, searching, longing, desperately wanting those we encounter to know what we know to experience what we've experienced. A life change so beautiful. A grace so sufficient. A mercy so unfathomable that we can't possibly keep it to ourselves. This is our mission. This is our purpose. To pursue the calling of Jesus to the ends of the earth. Will you answer that call? The call to wander? The call to search? The call to walk? The field? our mission. This is our mission. Amen. Jesus said it well. What a great reminder. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, talking to his disciples, people of faith, people like several of us here today. And he said, look, I care about people. I've come to help people. I've come to forgive people. I've come to save people. And I I see them as something worth getting my arms around, right? Jesus would say, I see people as a valued commodity. I, I see them like a harvest. Does that make sense? Like people, farmers, they don't plant acres and acres and acres and acres and acres, just like you don't do your work to not see a harvest. And Jesus said, you know what? I've worked really hard. I left heaven's throne and I've come and I've given everything for the sake of the, the ones I love, for people. And he would speak to believers and say, now I want you to not only go and represent to those people, but I also want you to pray for more workers to go out and help those people consider me. That's what Jesus would say. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm so grateful that in the past, others have accepted that call of God to not only pray, but to be willing to go and to help other people in their circles of influence, their arena of life, consider Jesus. I would dare say, I'm here today because of people like that. I would dare say that we are here today. You are here today because of faithful believers in Jesus Christ who prayed and said, Lord, make the most of my life and send more workers into the harvest field of people and make the most of my life so I can be one of those workers so that the people around me, whether in my home or at work or at school or where I play, in the marketplace, those people will have a glimpse of Jesus and have a chance to consider the goodness of God through Jesus. Aren't you glad for people who were faithful and prayed for more people to be harvesters of souls? And so they pray, they pray for, I would dare say that Jesus had you and me in mind when he prayed this way. And I think, in fact, I think the most honorable thing we can do right now and not wait for the sermon's end is to pause and pray right now that the Lord would send more workers into the harvest. Is that a fair thing to pray? Y'all with me? Wave, wave at me? Let's do it. Heavenly Father, today we've gathered and we've honored you, your Son, and we welcome your presence through your Holy Spirit. We have given you thanks and praise for the salvation we have found, the forgiveness of sin through Jesus and his blood, his sacrifice for us, your grace. We've sensed the Holy Spirit meet us as we've prayed and said, Lord, we need you in life to survive it, but we want to thrive, and Lord, we want to make a difference for you. And so, Lord, now we actually lean into your heart for people, people who are wandering in darkness, people who are hurting and suffering, and maybe they have not yet considered Jesus to be the way, the truth, and the life. 
and they've not really leaned in to trust Jesus the way many of us have. Lord, we pray for them today. People in our families, go ahead, I dare you, tell them their names. Lord, we pray for our loved ones. We pray for our extended family. We pray for friends. We pray for coworkers, people we know in school, people we know from the shops that we shop. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that, that you will send more workers into the harvest fields of Northeast Ohio and Northern Ohio, near and far, so that more people will have the opportunity, that these people we're thinking of and praying for, that you're bringing to mind, that you love, that they will have an opportunity to consider the grace of God through Jesus. And when they do, I pray, Lord, that they'll reconsider Jesus and continue to consider Jesus until they draw so close to Jesus they can't help but to totally lean in and take a leap of faith and trust the Lord as their Savior. So we pray that. And Lord, I dare ask that you would so cultivate our hearts to be those workers in the field. In Jesus' name, amen. And so that is missional living, amen? We are called to not just accept the graces of God and sit on them. We are called to live missionally and to do so faithfully. We like that word. I love that word. Faithfulness is a biblical word. Faith, to be faithful. I mean, if you're married and you took vows, you are respected when you lean into the expectation for you as a husband to be faithful to your wife. Right? Not one wife, I think one said amen. And ladies and husbands, so husbands, when your wives promise before God and all of these witnesses to be faithful, to love you, in spite of you, to the end, right? Faithfulness matters. It is commitment. It is, it is uh, steadfast. It, it is re reliable. It is trustworthy. And I think all of us, no matter how young you are in the room, and especially the older you are, because you've probably realized when you were younger how important this is, to be reliable and trustworthy, to be faithful is important in life. It's important in your relationships. It's important if you want to have a job and keep a job and make progress with the job, right? It's important if you want to make it through another day of class and you want to graduate, graduate one day. Faithfulness and reliability, making the most of your opportunities and your responsibilities is really important. And the Bible makes it perfectly clear that you and I are called to be faithful, reliable, consistent to the Lord and for the Lord. Hopefully we all share a value of faithfulness, a desire to be uh, you know, really reliable. And, and in, the, in the midst of all of the things in life that would sort of press the need to be faithfulness, to, to be faithful. I hope and pray that we have no greater desire every single day as we do those other things, no greater desire than to be faithful to the Lord as we do those things. Yes? And so I, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Those of you who went to Costa Rica on a mission trip, you may have considered yourself to be short-term missionaries on a short-term mission. But I would, I would beg to differ and say you are not a short-term missionary. You are a missionary for Christ everywhere your feet would trod. You were called to be on mission for Jesus. And I would say that's true. If you didn't go to Costa Rica, guess what? You are still called to live a missional life for Christ. And so last week we began to look at Ephesians 5. I know if you're not there yet, I told you earlier, Ephesians 5 and 6, Paul is encouraging people of faith like you and me. And he's saying believers who trust Jesus, he's encouraging us. He would say, live out in such a way, live out the gospel of Jesus in everything you do. Wherever you go, and he would just give us some, a snapshot. He would say, I want, I want you as believers, this is my prayer for you, to honor the Lord with how you live. To, and he would say things like this, to walk as Christ walked, with a Christ-like sacrificial love. You know what love does? It gives when you want to receive. He would say, be careful how you live, and be careful how you speak, and be careful with your your." your opportunities and tendencies to be greedy don't be like that be generous in all your ways and he would say be moral and be holy and live a godly life live as children of the light Jesus is the light of the world live as a child of the light have nothing to do with darkness be careful how you live he would say make wise decisions 
You know, wisdom is when you, you obtain knowledge and perspective, you've slowed down long enough, and, and then you apply that. You need to slow down, and the Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. James tells us if you need wisdom, you ask, and he'll get, so if you would just ask. And Paul, so all of this helps us lean into trusting the Lord so that we can represent the Lord every day in life. He goes on, don't be foolish, don't overdo it with substances. He says, don't be drunk. And then he really tells us how it's possible for you and me to live missionally for Christ in our world so that other people can consider Jesus by the things we say and and do. And he tells us in verse 18, here's the key. It's his presence. His presence makes all the difference. In your life and in my life, the way we live this week, faithfully or not for the Lord, will depend solely on our awareness of personal dependency upon his Holy Spirit. If we do it on our own, We fall short, we get frustrated, we burn bridges, we ruin Christ's reputation, and then next week we're just kind of asking for forgiveness instead of celebrating what God's done in our life this past week, right? So to be filled with the Holy Spirit, if we find it important to faithfully live for God every day, we need to acknowledge our need for the presence of the living God and his availability every single day, not just on Sunday. Fill with the Holy Spirit. So let me just summarize some of the things I shared it last week. I'll share it again. See in the New Testament the Holy Spirit's availability to help us. Various ways, uh, with our character and our conduct, the Holy Spirit wants to help you and me live like and look more like Jesus, right? Fruit of the Spirit. We spent the summer thinking about that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans chapter 12, the Holy Spirit wants to help us when we, when we lean into relationship as the body of believers, as a church, as a church family, the Holy Spirit equips our natural abilities with supernatural abilities. Those are called spiritual gifts so that we can encourage one another, so that we can then therefore exalt Jesus in the way we live. You see, the Holy Spirit helps us with that. You have, you have to choice. You have to lean into it. And then, of course, what we're talking about, all is encompassed in Acts chapter 1-8. The Holy Spirit is available to embolden us and empower us to represent Jesus well. Jesus said it this way in Acts chapter 1. You, he's talking to believers, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses. You see that key word? You know what a witness is in the court of law. It's someone that gives a, a test. I put my hand in the Bible. This is my truth, Right? I wouldn't lie about it. I wouldn't risk lying about it. This is the honest truth. This is what I've experienced. This is what I know. A witness. And so we kind of raise our hand to the Lord and say, Lord, help me be a witness for you. Holy Spirit, fill me so that I can be a witness in the way I live and the things I sometimes will say or not say so that I make a statement about who you are before the people I share life with. And so The Holy Spirit's available to help us do that. And again, why is this so important? Because Jesus calls every single believer to live life on mission. You you catch that? Don't miss this. Because if, if it's just like, well, I'm learning to come to church more. I get it. That's good. That should help you consider Jesus more and more. And the more exposed you are to Jesus, the more you should love him and trust him. And the more you love him and trust him, the more it shows up in the choices you make and the way others will see him in your life. Yes? So so Matthew 28, some of the final words of Jesus, Jesus says it this way to disciples, to people of faith like us. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So just let's keep that verse up there for one sec. So let's just take a look at it. Jesus says and said and would say to us, to people of faith, go near and go far. I think that encompasses, I would say it this way, wherever you go. Is that fair? Everywhere we go this week, Jesus would say, help other people consider me. Does that make sense? And then implied in the baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the fact that if they are exposed to me long enough, then they're going to make a profession of faith in me because water baptism is one of the first things people do is they go public with their faith, right? 
And then you're going to help them grow in faith as disciples. You're going to teach them. You see that up there? So that is all of our responsibility. That's not the pastor's solo job. That's not the deacon's job, the staff's job, the ministry leaders, growth group leaders. It is the, the call of God on our lives to live life missionally. You, if you believe in Jesus, you are a missionary. And the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit is available to help you represent Jesus all over northern Ohio. Amen. Matthew 5 tells us, well, shine bright for Jesus. Let other people see why you do what you do and why you do it, right? So there are opportunities absolutely everywhere for you and for me to shine. And I would say not only opportunities, but responsibilities before God. And I said it last week, I don't know that there is a um, more ripe harvest field uh, a, a more opportune arena than school and work. Does that make sense? Right? That like, it's, it's every day in some way, shape, or form dark, and we have an opportunity to represent Jesus, the light. And, and you may not like your job, but you're working hard, you're sticking with it, and maybe you're there, and the primary reason you're there is not necessarily for the paycheck. I mean, you need the paycheck, and God will honor your hard work and provide for you, but maybe the reason you're there is because God has you for this season. And, and maybe in spite of not liking so-and-so and this situation and all of it, maybe, maybe you're there to just represent Jesus. And I really believe this is true. I think our witness of Jesus and for Jesus is strengthened when we bring the right attitude and the right work ethic into school and to work. I would say the opposite is true. When, when our attitude stinks and we, don't, and we justify working less, we undermine the platform God's given us to help the people around us see and consider Jesus. Make sense? Now, I understand it. Most of you don't like your job. Statistics tell us that. Most of you don't like going to school. If you do, awesome. Love it. Embrace it. But here's the deal. The enemy wants to do everything he can to get you to hate the environments you're in. Because if he can get you so distracted and so frustrated and just all kind of tied up on the inside, it affects your focus. It affects who, who you're focused on. It, it, it affects who you're living for. Does that make sense? And all of a sudden, you, you, you're now, you, used to, you used to leave church on a Sunday. You're praising the Lord. You get to work on Monday. Ah, let me tell somebody about Jesus. Let me just work hard as under the Lord. Go to school the same way. But now, it's been six months, and I've been dealing with this issue at work or at school. And so now, our at, we praise Jesus on Sunday. Ah, okay. Ah, I sense God. But by the time Monday mor morning comes around, whew, right? In our own strength, we're weak. We're frustrated. And our attitude's affected. And... And we're no longer making an impact for Christ. And so in the next chapter, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul reminds everyone who is expected to work that they work for Christ. You, wait, hold on a second, Pastor. You heard, yeah, you heard me right. That if you are expected to work, pay or no pay. So students, this applies to you, right? You're in school. Um, volunteers in an organization, even in the church, Paul is going to remind us that we work for the Lord. When we work, I mean, you know, Labor Day is coming up, right? You're going to have a day off to thinking about this stuff, right? Coming up soon. When we work, our ultimate boss is above, okay? Ephesians chapter 6. Now, let me just make sure we're all on the same page here because this is some old school biblical terminology, and I want to just make sure we all understand this. So Paul is going to draw some, par I think we can just lean into the paradigm, get some parallels. He is going to draw a relationship between, back in the day, so um, masters and slaves, okay? We are not endorsing slavery, all right? 
Uh, we know that Jesus came to set us free spiritually and in every other way, right? And no one should be beneath anyone else in terms of being owned and mastered. Can I get an amen? Right? So that's not what we're talking about. Paul was addressing um, in the day those masters, we'll call them bosses, and those slaves, we'll call them workers or even students, and, he, and they, were both, they had both come to faith in Christ. And Paul was trying to help them figure out how to manage relationships in, within the context of, I have work for you to do, and I have work to do for you, right? Does that make sense? That's the world we live in, right? So we're not talking about slavery. We're not endorsing that. And then, amen? All right, down with that. So when we look at this, the earthly masters, I want you to just kind of substitute for yourself. Whenever we see in these verses here, earthly masters, I want you to substitute it for managers, supervisors, employers, business owners, boss man. You, you got it? Right? Um, professors, teachers. They're, they're like the boss of the classroom, right? Or, or of the school. Superintendent, principal, all that. Let's look at uh, verses 5 through 8. You with me? Say yes. Um, slaves, so we'll say workers obey your earthly masters let's go with bosses or teachers allow me the freedom to do that today um, obey them with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey christ obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you but as slaves or workers of christ doing the will of god from your heart serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the lord not people because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free, or worker or boss. Make sense? I mean, I, I think it's worth meditating on a little bit. Here, let me summarize what, what I gleaned from this passage. Paul is explaining how we can be missional, how we can be a missionary at work and at school. And here's what I see. Here it is. Work hard, not for your glory, but God's glory. Aim to please God with your work. Work as if Jesus were your boss. Trust God's pay scale. Oh, we could spend a whole day on that one. Some people think that being a witness at work, by the way, means to punch in at work, start working on, let's just go with an assembly line next to somebody, and Pray for the opportunity to be a witness and tell somebody about who Jesus is to me, what he's done in my life. And so sometimes we mistakenly think that being a witness at work means to stop working in order to talk. Now, here's what I would say. If you're not doing what you're expected to do, is that God-honoring? And, you know, Jesus has not only called you to be a, a witness to your peer on the assembly line, right? Right? He's also called you to be a witness to the supervisor who is watching through the camera, right? So our work ethic matters. Now, am I, am I saying never have a conversation? I'm not saying never have a conversation. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that you might, you know, sense the Holy Spirit stirring something up and say, hey, can we talk more about this at lunch? Can we talk more after work? Hey, lunch, a break is in 90 minutes. Can we catch it in the cafeteria? Whatever that looks like for you. Right? Does that make sense? You're not convinced. Let me, let me help you. Whenever you work real hard, you actually build a platform for you to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, verse 5. So workers, obey your earthly masters as you would obey Christ. Right? You know what it is to obey. All the parents in the room understand obedience really well. So here, here's, what it means, here's what it means to obey. Right? And it's to listen, hear, understand, and then do exactly what you've been asked to do. Listen, hear, understand, and do it. And I would say, and do it well. And do it when it needs to be done. Right? Like moms and dads, grandparents, when you're like, hey, clean that up, junior. Right? Like now. Right? You don't want to have to use now. Right? You want to say, hey, you know what, uh, that's on the floor, and you expect them to get up and clean it and clean their brother's stuff up too on, along the way. Right? So, so the goal 
for workers working as unto the Lord is, is to listen and meet expectations. As a pastor, can I just let me just kind of put the shoes on here? I want to work hard every day as unto the Lord. Does that make sense? I don't want to be lazy. I want to get after it for God. I realize that if I do, do, do not get after it for the Lord, I'm accountable for that, right? I mean, I'm not just an employee of Calvary Assembly of God. I'm part of the budget, of course, right? We get that. But I work for the Lord. Does that make sense? So my prayer. Lord, I want to be faithful today, not just on Sundays, but every single day of the week. God, I want to be faithful. I want to be in step with you. I want to honor you. I want to exalt you. I want to promote you. Help me by my actions. Help other people consider my Jesus. Holy Spirit, fill me and assist me and help me. And then I want to give the Lord my best every day. There's a lot of discernment that's needed in that because the needs never stop. And you have to kind of ask the Lord to help you prioritize what is most important in the moment. No different than you. So that's the way I sort of look at it. And I would say it's the same thing in the same way you ought to look at it. And Paul encourages Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul is, again, the same parallel we've talked about. Slaves and masters, managers and bosses and all that. He says this, all who are under the yoke of slavery, in other words, you have to work, you're sort of bound to it, you should consider their masters worthy of full respect. So if you're a worker or if you're a student, you should consider your teacher or your boss worthy of full respect. Why? So that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. So, so you're to consider your manager, consider your teacher worthy of your full respect, not just some of your respect. Notice earlier it said whether they're watching or not. And why do we do this? You work hard with a good attitude, and it results in God's name being honored. It means the way we are in the workplace, the way we are at school, can cause God's name and his word to be honored or slander. Did you catch that? Our work ethic and our attitude can either honor the Lord or dishonor the Lord. Wow, is there not potency in the way we enter our schools and our workplaces this week? Slander, you know what it means? If you were to look it up, slander is the action or crime of making a false spoken statement damaging to a person's reputation. The way we work, the attitude and the ethic at school and at work can either honor the Lord and help other people look in his direction or it can dishonor him and misrepresent him and slander him, damaging his reputation. Why? People look at people who are rebellious and lazy and if they claim to be a Christian or they attend that church and they've talked about it, they're like, if that's a Christian, if that's a follower of Christ, I'm not going to their church and I don't want to hear about their Jesus. Remember, when you go to work or school tomorrow, this week, you represent Jesus. People are watching to see how you act and how you react, how you respond to supervisors and how and work well with peers is there really something different about him or her because of their relationship with Christ you see so much of our witnessing is done without words some people in your workplace you better believe it are looking for a reason to turn away from the Lord they're looking at you don't give them a reason work hard Say, oh, but man, the situation at work is so hard. I've got a difficult boss and a difficult teacher. Anybody ever had a difficult boss or teacher? Right? 1 Peter 2.18, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your bosses, right? Your masters, your teachers. Not only to those who are, listen to this, not only the good ones who consider your well-being, they're considerate, but in reverent fear of God, submit to those authority figures even when they're harsh. Some of your translations use the word unreasonable. Some of you have an unreasonable boss or teacher. Work hard as if you're working for the Lord. But man, they're so challenging. I can't stand my, man, well, the way they look at me, the way they call me out, and they, they make a big deal out of it when I do this, but other people are doing the same, all that stuff. 
It's hard. But please be very careful. You represent Jesus Christ. Do you remember verse 18 of Ephesians 5? But be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, it's almost impossible. I know in our own strength it's so challenging. But with God, all things are possible. Pray every day. Welcome the Holy Spirit. Surrender to his control. Go to school. Go to work. Whether they are unreasonable or reasonable, you work hard for the glory of God. You are called to be a light in a dark place. You are called to be a missionary to help other people consider Jesus. If you have an unreasonable or harsh boss and and you still work hard, you shine brighter for Jesus. Anyone can serve an unreasonable boss or a reasonable boss, but it takes a spirit-filled follower of Jesus to serve somebody who's harsh and unreasonable. Everybody else would just quit and have a few choice words out the door. Let's remember Chapter 6, Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 5, you workers obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and sincerity of heart. Verse 7, as if you were serving the Lord, not people. So when you're in class and the teacher is just driving you nuts and you find yourself in the principal's office and you did nothing wrong, or, or you're having a chat with that supervisor over that issue, Remember who your boss is. In fact, it says, imagine Jesus being your boss. So we're getting ready to go to work, maybe tomorrow. Getting ready to go to school, and we pause, and and we pray, and we express our heart's desire. Lord, I I don't want to displease you. Holy Spirit, fill me today. I'm pausing today before I rush out the door. Be with me today. Help me today. And you know what? He will. He does. And and the more you pray that way and invite him, the more moments throughout the day you'll sense his promptings. You'll recognize when you're starting to lean into yourself a little too much, falling prey to the allure of gossip and dissension and disrespect. You'll feel a prompting of the Holy Spirit. Hey, watch your attitude. You haven't spoken a word, but I see your heart. And you'll you'll remember the prayer you prayed that morning in the Holy Spirit. That's right, lean back in. The Holy Spirit, His presence will be with you and make all the difference. Whenever you're at work and you begin to pray this way and the Holy Spirit begins to help you, you'll begin to stand out. And people will begin to notice. Because most people don't have a great attitude and a great work ethic. But when you do, they'll wonder why. And then when they begin to ask the question, you know, I notice a difference in you, and and your attitude just, what's the deal? And then you can respond honestly. Well, it's not like the job's easy, but I've been praying, and I've been asking God for help. You know what you just, you know what you were right there? A missionary helping somebody consider Jesus. It's okay to say, you know what, I, I just realized that my ultimate boss is not so-and-so, but it's God. And I want to work to please my maker and my savior. Jesus has done so much for me. Everything I do, I do for him. You didn't have to have a speech memorized. You didn't have to have the New Testament memorized. Right? You just worked hard. And when people noticed, you gave them a reason for who you are, Jesus. You let people know, I have a a sincere desire to honor God in everything I am, everything I do. So, you know, like last week, I asked the question, well, how about you, Calvary Assembly of God? I mean, what's your desire? How about you as an individual? I mean, what, what what is your missional calling? Who do you work for? This week, who will you work for? This week, whose glory will be at stake? This week, whose name will either be honored or slandered? I'm just inviting you to invite the Holy Spirit to fill you, to assist you, to help you, to strengthen you, to faithfully live and work for the Lord with every responsibility and opportunity that life brings your way at work and at school. 
Are you, are you with me? Does anybody deep down kind of have a desire to live for Jesus and to be faithful? You all with me? You, you want to honor the Lord. You, you want to help other people consider Jesus. You with me, yes? Because, I mean, that's, that's where we are in this little, however long, how many weeks we look at this. This is what we're talking about. This is what we're praying about. A desire to recognize that there is a harvest field. And Jesus, Matthew chapter 9, he looked at the crowds of people that you work with, you go to school with. In verse 36, he had compassion on those people because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest, he says to disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. What's implied? Do your job, and while you are a worker in the harvest field, verse 38, ask the Lord, pray to send out more workers into his harvest field. So, the choice is always yours. Who you'll trust in, what you'll trust him for, whether you'll live like him, live with him, live for him, empowered by him, is always our choice. If you would receive that call of God on your life to go into your world this week, in the workplace, where you volunteer, where you study, and you say, you know what, I want to honor the Lord, I want to be faithful this week, more faithful than I was last week, with my heart, with my attitude, with my respect, would you just stand, I just want to pray together, and say, Lord, here we are, we are those workers, we've prayed for more workers, we want to be the answer to that prayer, we want to represent you well, and, and church, let me just, let's just think about this. As people stand everywhere and they're like, you know what? Yeah, I want to trust Jesus. I want to invite the Holy Spirit and I want to shine for Christ. I want you to look around the room because I want you to recognize the potential for Jesus to be made known in Northeast Ohio. If, if we do very little more than pray every day this week, each one of us, and invite the Holy Spirit to help us shine for Christ with our attitude and our work ethic, Think about the potential to help literally hundreds and thousands of people consider Jesus this week. You'll go places I'll never go. And if you've invited the Holy Spirit, when you get there and you go there and you do that with those people, Jesus, the presence of the Spirit of God comes with you and those people have a chance to consider Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house today, to worship you, to thank you for the good graces. We thank you again for Jesus. We thank you for our Savior, our forgiver. Thank you for the one who went to the cross, bled and died so that our sins can be paid for, our consequences for sin can be erased. Hallelujah. We thank you for, Jesus, who you are, what you've done for us. Holy Spirit of the living God, thank you for helping us lean into your word today. It's truly like a flashlight to our path. We're understanding more and more our responsibility and our opportunity to be faithful, to be trustworthy, to honor you, not just on Sunday mornings as part of the package, but the rest of life, the arena of life at work and at school. We want to represent you well. We want to be faithful. We want to have an attitude and a character and a conduct that represents Jesus. We want to give an account. We want to be a witness for Christ. But I pray specifically for those going to school in this season again, that their work ethic will, they'll be reminded that, that the Holy Spirit's there to help them work hard and apply their best efforts. And God, you'll be with them and you'll protect them and you'll help our students. And, and again, for those going into the workforce, part-time, full-time, even volunteers somewhere, even in the church, Lord, that whatever we do, we'll do it well. Like yesterday, Lord, as we served at the Meeting Place Church in the Buckeye neighborhood, so many of us serving, not for a paycheck, but God, for your salary, your pay stub, just wanting to honor you and represent you to passers-by, to clean up the neighborhood and, and just say, this is what it looks like to be led of the Lord and to honor the Lord and serve the Lord. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity for us to represent Jesus there yesterday. And I thank you for the opportunities to represent Jesus here today. And I thank you for the opportunities to represent Jesus tomorrow and every day this week. And we'll have the opportunity to come back and worship you and celebrate you Sunday for the great ways you, by your Spirit, have strengthened us to work as unto the Lord. Again, Lord, for those who need Jesus, we pray you'll reveal yourself to them. And if need be, do it through us by the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. 
In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Hey, listen, before I let you go, we always want you to know there's an opportunity to pray here. You never have to rush out the door, and you never need to pray alone. Sometimes you may want to do that. But we always have, we have a prayer ministry team, and we always have some people available to pray with you, pray for you. They usually make themselves available in some of the corners, if not all of them at times. And you may go up to them and say, you know what, I need prayer because that work is hard. Maybe it's related to the message today. At, at school, you're like, man, my attitude stinks because, man, this teacher, whatever it is, the people around me, they'll pray with you. They'll take, just take a moment, they'll pray with you. Call on the presence of the Lord. Um, you may have other needs. Maybe you need a healing in your body. We believe Jesus not only forgives, he heals. He's still available to heal today. He does supernatural things. You should have heard Ashland's testimony in Costa Rica when I spoke to the church and said, Jesus is the same God. He still heals. And Ashland got up and said, I had a cyst, a tumor in my brain, and the doctors couldn't understand why after prayer it's gone. Jesus still heals. I don't know why he does what he does when he does, but I know we can still ask and believe. So if you need prayer for any of that, and don't miss this one. We just prayed for people who need Jesus. And maybe you're here today and you're like, you know what? I'm here and I am considering Jesus. I have been considering Jesus. I'm reconsidering Jesus. And I need to personalize my faith today. Don't leave the place wondering what to do with that. You don't have to wonder. It's so simple and clear. It's almost so childlike the way the Bible describes it. And I would say to you, if you are processing your own personal faith, do yourself a huge favor. Take five minutes make your way to one of these folks. I see Donna in the back. I see Pastor Chris, I think, in the back, uh, in the front here. Make your way to, in a minute, we're going to dismiss, not embarrassing anybody, but maybe you go up to them and say, you know what? I want to solidify my faith in Jesus today. I, I'm declaring, I, I just, will you pray with me? I, I need to get things right with the Lord. I want to live for the Lord the way we talked about today. And they'll pray with you. They'll even give you some biblical resources and encourage you. Y'all with me? Say yes. So some of you need to find a place to pray. Some of you may just want to sit and stay. It's the most peaceful place you'll be in all week long, you know what I mean? God's presence in God's house and God's people does that, God's word. So you're welcome to stay. I pray God blesses you and empowers you to live for Jesus every single day, every waking hour, with every breath you have this week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.